I want to tell you a story. Many years ago, every street, every house is lighted with an oil lamp. I grew up in that period when I would study at night, I would light the oil lamp, and then I would uh, first clean the wick, and then I would light it and put the glass cover on it. And so I would study every night as a student uh, until I fall asleep about 9, 9.30. Then there came a time when somebody decided that there was a better way of lighting our streets and our house. And uh, so everybody knew, well, hope there's some way we can do without having to pour this oil lamp and then have to light the oil lamp. And uh, must be a more convenient and clean way. But nobody thought really thought it was possible. Except one man. You know his name. Edison. And so he decided that there must be a better way using clean electricity. So he got his assistants to help him do some experiments. So they used all kinds of materials, uh, fibers, wool, bind together, and then they passed electricity through it. It didn't work. And they work on it for months and months. 2,000 experiments had gone on and on and on. And so they still couldn't find a way. So his worker said, Mr. Edison, why are you wasting our time? You know it cannot be done. We have already done 2,000 experiments. And none of them have worked. So... Don't you think it's time to give up? Don't you think it's time to stop talking about electricity powered light bulb? So they waited for him to answer. And Mr. Edison said, Yes, you have done 2,000 experiments. But the 2,000 experiments taught us something. It teaches us there are 2,000 ways in which it will not work. But our goal is not to prove what will not work. We have got one goal, and uh, to find what works. So, so what shall we do? Do another 2,000 more experiments. Because the goal is to light the streets, light our house with clean electricity. So here you sit down with light coming on and you don't have to burn any light, any oil lamps. And you have taken it for granted. But what about the 2,000 experiments about it seems to be wasted? No, it was not wasted. It taught us what does not work. And if that was not done, we will never have discovered, oh, not we, but Mr. Edison's staff, would never have discovered what works. So just like these workers of Mr. Edison who work without a vision, the question they ask is, why are we wasting our time? It will not work. So sometimes, you know, the book of Deuteronomy talks a lot about blessings and curses. It seems that more about curses than blessings. And some of us may feel, hey, Pastor, we already talked about so many curses. Why are we still talking about curses? Where's the end of it? The end of it is God is trying to show us 2,000 ways, no, not 2,000 ways, 53 ways where blessings will not work. So you need to know how it will not work before you learn how it works. God's purpose of Deuteronomy is not to whack us and say, okay, you do this, I'm going to whack you. You do that, I'm going to whack you. I'll whack you for this, I'll whack you for that. No, that was not, you are misunderstood. God is trying to tell us that life is dependent on blessings 
good things and bad things, blessings and curses. In the physical realm, we cannot see it. But this is talking about the spiritual realm. Everything about success and experiencing God's goodness has to do with avoiding what will be negative. So if you have not learned what is a negative effect, the things that block us from attaining to blessing, if all you heard of all these many months is that God is waiting to whack us for the smallest mistake you make, you not only have misunderstood God, you have insulted God because you think He's such a lousy guy. So today, I'm going to talk about the pinnacle of Deuteronomy. You know, when you climb up a mountain, it's hard work climbing up, 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 up. Sometimes you slip you down. But when you reach the top of that mountain, where all the blessings are, you need to learn how to get hold of it. So today, we are coming to the top of the mountain. And therefore, you need to learn what does not work first. And today, you'll need to learn what works. But most of you won't believe what I'm going to say to you. And you'll not experience it. You heard me? Most of you will not experience it. Because you don't believe. Because you don't know what blocks it. So, um, today's lesson is very important. Is about taking hold of God's magnanimous blessings. You know, this big word, magnanimous, I struggle to find a simpler word. Uh, magnanimous means generous. Magnanimous means, uh, 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 you know, uh, wholehearted blessing from God. How generous He is, how eager He is. So today, I find that this topic is quite uh, extensive. So I'm going to do three things here today. I'm going to help you to firstly see what God says. And so we'll do a lesson on observation. And then I will be taking you through some observations because if you do not know how to observe what God says, all you see are negative things. Only cursing, that's all. You don't understand that if you don't know what caused the curses, you will know how to avoid the curses and then enter into blessing. So if you have got this newsletter, I'm going to go through it step by step. And uh, if you can grasp what it says, you will never be the same. We sang that song, Experiencing God's goodness. God is good. God is good. God is good. What's so good about God? People ask. But today, I'm trying to get you to see God is so good, most of you don't even believe it. So that's why the only word I can find is the word magnanimity or magnanimous. So you got your power. But today, I'm going to use NIV instead of KJV, because uh, someone come and lower this for me, please. Um, then I'm going to take you through with the uh, notes, and then I'm going to explain how you are entering into experiencing God's goodness. Yes, same level, same, same. Thanks. So you can open this. And then I will go through it, and then I've got some points I'm going to highlight. Before that, I'm going to pray for those I sense there's someone here who feels you are sleep deprived. Uh, so I want to pray a blessing on you. Father, I bless everyone here with an opening of spiritual eyes to see what good things you have prepared for those who love you. And I bless 
those who are sleep deprived, those who have difficulty sleeping, insomnia cases, apnea cases, in Jesus' name, I cast it out from you and I speak right now the peace of God that passes all understanding. That you feel not only the peace of God, but the goodness of God. Holy Spirit, enlighten each one of us so that we'll not be always thinking negatively about the Word of God. But Lord, help us open our eyes that we may see good things you have prepared for each one of us. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's nice to hear one Amen right in the center. When you say Amen, you are saying to God, that's for me. That's why it's important to say Amen. Now, our key verse is found in Deuteronomy 28.1. I'd like you to read loudly to, with me together. Uh, maybe we project first this one, and then I'll, meanwhile, I'll look at... Okay? So let's read it, verse 1, projected. Let's say Deuteronomy 20. If you fully... Deuteronomy. Ah, that's good, but can you speak a bit louder because you're speaking blessing upon yourself. Okay, one, two, go. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. If only long and carefully follow. No. Good. Good. Now, I want you to take note. Uh, what are some of the key words? What do you observe here? Okay, what's the first word here it's giving you? What's the first word? If I... What's the first word? Okay, if stands for I fully. Okay, I fully. I fully what? It was the third word here. I fully what? Obey. Fully obey. And what's another fully? Uh, uh, is there another word fully? No. So what about carefully? English major. Uh, carefully means what? Fully care. Is it correct or not? So that's also fully correct or not? So let's say it's fully. This second fully is what? Fully what? Follow. Is it correct? Yeah, so one is fully obey, second fully follow. You got that? Okay, that if you got a Bible, you mark it now. Then, uh, what about this fully obey? So fully obey is always connected to a person, not some rules. It's a person. Obey what? Or obey who? What's the word? It says the Lord. Now, one observation in this particular passage is he's talking about the Lord. Throughout it's about the Lord. Why? Because it's about a relationship. It's not obey God. It's obey the Lord, your God. It's your God. You have chosen him. So it's about obeying a person with whom you have a relationship. So we are talking about obeying not a set of laws, so much as obeying a person. All right? So second fully, fully or with care, carefully do what? What's the action word? Follow. Follow what? Follow his commands. So follow how many commands? Ah, keyword underline all. So 
It's to do with why do some people ca- not able to get into the blessings? Because they did not follow the law. They followed, uh, uh, they, they follow uh, the commandments, but they didn't follow all. They just follow what is convenient. It says follow all, remember? So this is a very important condition. If IF stands for I follow all, or I, I fully follow all, that's the second condition. So, I fully follow all. The first condition, I fully obey the Lord because I have a relationship with Him. I'm following not a set of religious teachings, but I'm following, I'm obeying a person whom I have relationship with. But I also fully follow all his commands, not just some religious teachings. And if you check this verse, how many ifs can you see? Can you count how many ifs? How many? Okay. And then how many times does he say, Lord? All right, let me show you my... I've marked my Bible, but it doesn't come out so clearly, uh, this passage. Okay, can you see? All right, ah, maybe it's clearer there. See, I marked the word fully, I marked the word Lord, and I use the word if is twice. So if is important, Lord is important. Lord is repeated three times. So, um, fully, fully obey, fully follow. Obey who? Not what. Follow what? Follow all. So, you see how many times does the word all appear in this verse? Can you see? Follow all his commands. God will set you above all. And does it say, all these blessings? Three times all. Do you know something about this chapter? The words, the language used is all very, very extensive words. Very extensive. You see the word all, or everything, or uh, all the time. All, all, all. Later on, when you go back, please do an exercise. Look at all. Today, I want to ask you, I want to tell you what I want to work at. First of all, I want to talk about the simple conditions. You got that? Underline the word conditions. You see, underline conditions, you underline the conditions. So I'm going to talk about conditions. You got the notes? By the way, you can wave your note to me. I notice some of you don't have the notes. Only you have. Is it okay for you to underline what I underline? Because it'll help you to focus. Now, you see three words here in this three question. I'm going to answer three questions. The first question is conditions for blessings. You need to know conditions. Second, you need to know how magnanimous, how magnanimous or how generous God's blessings are. They are big. God is a great God and He blesses greatly. Third question I'm going to address is misunderstandings. Because we misunderstand God's promises and conditions, and we already have a preconceived idea it's too good to be true, most Christians will not experience the goodness of the Lord. Three questions. Conditions, what is magnanimous, and misunderstandings. So there must be a language of magnanimity. You need to learn some language that God uses in this passage. So, You'll find that in my Bible, I've marked it all this way. 
All right. So you got your Bible. You can also use this as a reference. So I mark all the ifs. I mark all the alls. I mark all the uh, conditions. So all right. So I'm not going to show you so many things. So I'll stick to your notes. Then I'm going to explain. And I've got some visuals I'm going to show you. So the first thing that you need to know is that God has simple conditions for blessing. So your point one, what are the simple conditions? He begins with the word if. So if... Uh, I'm trying to adjust. So if, you got it in your notes, if you follow it, the 14 verses is all I'm going to cover today. So the first thing is fully obey, fully follow all, listen, and turn not aside. So in this short passage, 14 verses, four things, but all stems from the first two. Fully obey, fully follow. That's all. The conditions. And in order to do so, you have to listen and you have to not turn aside. So these are two. A. That's all you need to know about. If. Simple conditions. So, first of all, you need to know what if means. If means I fully. Second, you need to remember his words. God says, if you don't remember my promises, you cannot take hold of it. So, again and again, way back in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, God says, remember that it is God, the Lord, who gives you the ability to gain wealth. Don't forget, because the day you forget, your wealth will disappear. Then, second, besides third thing you need to do is to choose. So, you need to choose. You know, blessings and curses is a choice. Strange, right? We choose. God says again and again, even in Deuteronomy 11, then Deuteronomy chapter 30, again three times God repeated, I said us blessings before you, blessings and curse. Choose. Choose. Because it's your choice. The choice you make determines your destiny. But how do you choose? This is what I'm going to help you to do. Three things to enter into conditions for blessings. Because if you did not make a choice, a conscious choice, then the blessings cannot flow. All right. So to sum up, I got a picture for you. What does it say? God says, fully obey, fully follow all. Pay attention to his commands. Walk in his ways. Don't turn aside. So I've given you. But these are conditions for blessings to flow. Why did we talk about the curses last week? Because the, those curses are conditions that blocks the blessings. But today, we also want to go into this. What is the blank check of overall blessings? So, we are going to talk about God setting you on high. What does that mean? All blessings. You see the word all? The word all is used for blessings. God wants us to get all the blessings, not some. But don't, we don't even know what are all the blessings, so it's not possible unless you make a point to know what are all blessings. And the blessings must come to you instead. Just now we sang that song, it must run, it must overtake you. It's a blessing chasing you. Uh, Chinese people have a saying that money must chase you, not you chase money. Have you heard of this? Of course, most of us are still waiting. How come the money hasn't catch up with us yet? So, Blessings are like that. It must overtake you. God is sending the blessings, chasing after you so that it overtakes you. That's what the language is all about. Now, the second thing you need to know 
about this series is ah, this is the important part. How does God speak? This is how does what are the languages God use? In what way is it magnanimous? All right, I'm going to explain this. You see, God's blessings are, there are three areas I want you to understand the language God's use. By the way, these languages are to just to help you to take a grasp of the blessings. But you, you need to ask the Lord to open your eyes because it's only the Holy Spirit opening our eyes that we understand all this language of magnanimity. So, even the book Jeremiah 17, God says that those who trust in men, those who make flesh his arm, in other words, depend on favor from people, and his heart has departed from the Lord, he will not see when good comes. NIV says, when the blessings come, he can't even see it. When the goodness comes, we can't even see it. How do you take hold of it? This is the problem. So the first thing we need to learn is how to see. And this language here is trying to help you to see what are the magnanimous blessings. They are not small blessings, they are big. Just one of them is already very, very helpful to you. So the, Lord, the first thing is, there are three things. God speaks, God demonstrates, and God extends. So three words. So the first thing is, He speaks, but He speaks in superlative. It means big words. First superlative, he says, is the word all. Take note, it's all. So in these 14 verses, God is trying to say, look, I want you to experience all the goodness that I want to give to you. All, not just one or two. All. God wants us to have it all. The world says you cannot have it all. But the word says, the Lord says, all is repeated throughout. Go back and count how many alls. You'll find that it's repeated again and again. When God sets you on high so that all the nations of the earth will see His uh, blessing on you and so on. It, it, God desires that we experience all. Oh, maybe we say, I, I'm not so big, uh, greedy, I just say some. Uh, that's false modesty. God says, it's all is what I've prepared for you. Of course, you have to learn step by step how. The Lord will set you. The first thing, the big picture is God said, He will set you what? High. What does it mean to be high? It says high. It says above all. Now, these two words, above all, is a very powerful word. Above all, God is a God of above all. He says, above all the nations of the earth. That's one superlative. Then in this verse you just read earlier on in the first verse, God says, all these blessings will overtake you. God is talking about all blessings. All. I know some of you will say, look, I don't even see one. But says, the word all appears many times. And one of the times that appears again and again is the word all that you put your hands. All. Everything you put your hand to, you will prosper, God says. All. I will bless all. You lay your hands on it because of your relationship with me, you will see all the work, all that you set your hands on is a very, very generous world. He repeats again in verse 12, 
bless all the work of your hand. Because we all don't believe it or don't understand. So you repeat twice. All. All. And it says the work. It doesn't say the works. That means anything you add on. Singular work. Work of your hands. See? All, all, all. You must. That's what God wants us to experience. B. Second, God demonstrates or God acts. You see, God is an active God. And I've given it sevenfold acts of God. It's all here. You need to underline it, but let me give you a transparency on how. Because this is a very, very important. How does God demonstrate? Okay. God is not a God who just talks. He acts. How does God demonstrate? So this is in your notes. Right, let me just put it up so I can talk to you. There's a sevenfold acts of God. In these simple 14 verses, God says that these are the kind of actions. The first thing he says, he, he sets. Set is an active word. Set you high. That speaks of honoring you so that you look good so that you have a position of authority. And uh, the word set means a selected action of placing you where he chooses. Set, like diamonds. When you put on a gold ring, you have to set it. That means there must be a plan. There must be a purpose. But of course, the ultimate purpose is to glorify his name. But he sets us up. I call it for success. He sets us up. So you will not smell success if you set yourself up. God has to set you up. And that conditions fully obey, fully follow. Now, this setting up is first used in Genesis 1 when God said, He set all the planets in His place. He sets it in that orbit. He sets it uh, by fine-tuning uh, the speed, the, 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 the flight path, the, uh, you know, the timing, and all the details. God is the one who sets. And you need to please Him if you want to see Him set. Second, God is actively grants. Now, this word grant in the Hebrew, it has to do with dedicating a particular blessing to you, special to you. That's the word grant. So what does he grant? Twice, God says, victory against enemies. Who Do you have any enemy? There are many enemies. There are many scammers all over. God says there will be victory. But the second one is abundant prosperity. Now, this is what every Chinese-speaking people want. Prosperity. Chinese New Year, we talk about prosperity. Uh, our government say, oh, prosperity. Prosperity hopefully will never end. But abundant prosperity is something God wants us to experience. And uh, so that you sense His love for you. The third action word, has to do with sand. God does some sanding. You know, blessings are being sent, delivered. Today we have panda food, crab food, whatever food. You like it to be sent to you, right? You love somebody, you order it, and it's sent. It's not you going out to search. It's being delivered to you at your doorstep. Can you see the word sand? So God has to do the sending. What does He send? He says two things He will send. First, He will send a blessing on everything you do. Send a blessing. That's what verse 8 says. Uh, and I don't cook up any of this. It's all from this short passage, which I believe you have already read, which I suppose you already seen. I'm just giving you the observations that God sends. He sends victory. 
he sends a blessing. He said, I'll send a blessing on your barn. What is a barn? We are not farmers. Barn is where you store the excess harvest. Barn speaks of harvest. So if your barn is empty, then uh, you didn't have any harvest. But God said, I'll send a blessing on your barn. That means your storehouse will have plenty. That means your harvest will be good. Then he said he will send rain. All this talk about global warming and so on. All God need to do is just send the rain. All the global warming, will get, you'll get global cooling. Right? We are so grateful to God. The last few days there's rain. And uh, when there's rain, we don't feel any global warming. So God says, I'm sending. Do you know the rain is something God sends? God has to send it. So when it's hot, ask God for the rain to be sent. I was living in England for some time, and uh, I hear people at bus stops on the, because that year, 78, was a heaviest snowfall for seven months, nonstop snowfall. And uh, when I took the bus to university, uh, and uh, I, I see other Britishers standing next to me, say, cursing the weather. Ah, it's so cold, the snow keeps falling, and so on, you know. And then one day I asked to speak at the Brethren Church. And so I said, you know, I'm a visitor to this country, and when I take the bus at the bus stop, I often hear Britishers saying, it's so cold, why is he complaining about the weather? And I say, i got a suggestion for you. Next time round, why didn't you ask God to reduce the, uh, stop sending so much snow and increase the temperature a little bit? Uh, you, get, you need some global warming. And uh, so after I preached, one deacon came up to me, oh, brother, uh, I never thought of it this way, you know, that we can ask God to change the weather. But in ancient times, when, how did Israel at one time got the rain? Because one man asked for the rain. His name called, uh, his name, one of our members got his name. You know his name? Elijah. See, Elijah asked for rain. There was rain. Elijah said, Lord, stop the rain. The rain stopped. So, sending is something God will do. The fourth thing, God blesses. So he says, I bless you in the land. I'll bless all the work, singular, the work of your hand. I will bless, I will bless. So, blessings don't come because we follow a principle. Blessing comes because God actively delivers it. So unless God says, I bless you, and when God says, I bless you, you don't say, Amen. So you cannot get any blessing. Amen means, yes, Lord, I agree. I want this blessing. So I say, Amen. Very good. So every time we sing this song about Amen, when there's a speaking of a word of Amen, uh, it's blessing spoken, say, Amen. You know, one... Uh, before I got married, I was in, uh, uh, living in Israel. And I also, believe it or not, I also got a girlfriend that time. Uh, just started. So my girlfriend sent me a card that says, Numbers chapter 6. The Lord keep you, bless you and keep you. That song you just sang just now. And uh, the Lord give you peace. That was 1968. I still got that card, you know. I, I still keep that card. So the other day, my wife was watching me review my scriptures. I got it all in a box. And I saw that card. And since my wife, sometimes we pray together. I said, sweetheart, can you look at this card? I wonder who sent to me. She looked at it. She keep quiet. So I said, sweetheart, does that card still hold? 
I wouldn't tell you what she said. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. Say amen to it when you receive it. Because you know, yeah, because when God promised a blessing, He says, I want to send you the blessing, but you say, ah, uh, let me think about it. Yeah, you can carry on thinking, but you will not get it. So the Lord says, I bless you. He actively engages in it. Number five, He said, I establish you as His own. I establish as my people. I establish you as my people. I'll establish you so that you will not get shaken. When things go wrong, when problems come up, you will not get shaken. Because you are established, you are stable, you are full of faith, you are confident. That's the word Jeremiah used. That he who puts his confidence in the Lord, he shall see when good comes. He'll be like a tree planted beside a river and his roots spread out beside the waters. His leaf will be green, will not be anxious in a time of drought. Neither shall cease from bearing fruit because his confidence is in the Lord. That's Jeremiah 17. 7 and 8. So you need to set your confidence in the Lord and God establishes us so that we are not shaken in a time of drought. When there is a problem arising, we will not be shaken because God is with us. God strengthens you. God is your anchor. Sixthly, he said, I open. Ah, this one, huh? It's a very important... We all talk about open doors, open opportunity. When we talk about opening, we always talk about opportunities, right? God says, I'll open two things for you. One, I'll open the heavens. NIV used heavens. Uh, I know P KJV used heaven. But heavens... It tells me that He blesses us in a physical realm, in a spiritual realm, and ultimately prepares for our eternal realm when we will live with Jesus forever and ever. All three realms, we experience goodness. You know, some people, non-Christians say, you Christians talk about your great reward in eternity, but you know, I cannot wait so long. What about this life? Well, that's part of the first heavens. And what about second heaven? You know, uh, emotional stability or e depression is a second heaven issue. It's a spiritual issue. Depression or happiness. This one, God opens heavens. He says, I'll open my storehouse. You know, to emphasize this, God uses two words. First of all, He said, I'll open the heavens. Then He said, I will open the storehouse. Verse 12, look at your scripture with, with me. You open your Bible. The Lord will open the heavens. That's the first thing. Second thing, the storehouse. And it's the storehouse of His bounty. Now, you need to understand the spiritual language of these words. When God opened the heavens, He's talking about the windows of heaven. In Malachi chapter 3, God says that if you, if you give, um, if you uh, worship me with offerings, I will show you that when I open the windows of heaven, and when I pour out my blessings, you can't even contain it. It's too much. It's more than enough for you to use. God opens the windows. You need to experience this sometime in your life. 
But if you always say, I, I, my bills are not paid, you know, I got not enough money even to survive, then you are not living under what is called the open heaven. Does it sound like God is trying to curse us? No, He wants to open these heavens. But because we all keep thinking about curse, 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 those curses God is talking about, uh, you notice when the Bible in the 53 curses, it didn't say God curse. Do you notice? Yes, once, twice God will do the cursing. But most of the 53 curses for the rest of chapter 28, it doesn't say God curse. It says that the curse will come upon you as part of a cause and effect. For instance, if you jump down from a tall building, what is the effect you're going to get? You'll come hit the ground. But what's the cause? Well, you say gravity. So there are principles in the physical realm, in chemistry, in zoology, in uh, uh, science, all have principles or laws. So we've got magnetic laws, we've got law of aerodynamics and so on. Everything is governed by certain laws. It's not like we are under the law, we are no more under the law, it's not like that. It's in the spiritual realm, there are laws. For instance, a person who keeps on idols in his home, he'll invite a curse. God doesn't have to curse him. It's a cause and effect. If you're unfaithful to God, you will not receive any blessings. Just like if a man divorces his wife, what is the outcome? Automatically, the wife got no more access to the husband's resources. Neither is the husband have access to the wife's resources because the relationship is broken. So that's the cause of the divorce will have an effect. The effect is that you have no more access to each other's resources. I mean, it's, this is the kind of principle you need to understand. So the open heavens, God is talking about a bountiful storehouse. It, it, it tells us that uh, in this passage, there are two, twice the word storehouse is used. The first storehouse is found in chapter uh, 28, verse, uh, uh, verse 8. Now, uh, your NRV said your barns, but uh, your KJV uses the word storehouse. Okay, so God said, I bless your storehouse. But here God says, he also got storehouse. He says, I open my storehouse for you. Tell me, tell me, your house, storehouse is bigger or God's storehouse is bigger? Obviously. You, your storehouse got more valuable things or God's storehouse got more valuable things? Obviously. So that's why you have to tap into God's storehouse. So God says, I'll open my storehouse. And it's a bountiful. In bountiful means it's overflowing. God says he must do the opening. And of course, the last day, God must open the gate of heaven. Because if you have no relationship with him, sorry, no opening of the gate of heaven for you. So that's called a curse. But what it means is that you will not experience it. Now, God does the opening. And lastly, God says, He made us. Wow, this one is, a, I don't know about you, I find it very interesting. Twice, God says, I'll make you. So sometimes your success, God has to make you. God has to do the making. Sometimes you and I cannot make a success of our lives. We try, but we don't make any progress. We see no fruit. But God says, I will make you. What? There are two things here about making. And he repeats it in a different way. He says, you are, I'll make you the head and not the tail. Now, let me explain this first. What do you mean by God saying, I'll make you the head? So, if you want to make the head, God has to make you the head, not you make yourself. Can you see? God says, I make. So, what do you mean by head and not the tail? Head means... You are the one who have control of your situation, of your life, 
of your circumstances. You make the first choice. And that tail means you just drag him along. He has to just follow what you do. He has no choice. He has to follow you. Where you go, he has to follow behind. When you are the head, you enjoy the best, the best cut of the meat, so to speak. And then if you are the tail, you, well, you try to enjoy the leftovers. That's what a tail is. So I went to school, I was the tail. I was so tail that I couldn't be a lower tail because 38 students in primary one, my class position was 38. One kid came to attend our meeting one day. He told uh, Jasmine, you know, I like the story by uh, Pastor 38. He said, who is Pastor 38? Oh, your pastor, Lord, last Sunday, you say he's primary one, his uh, position is number 38. Oh, he remember my position 38. Oh, uh, well, primary two, uh, I didn't make much progress either. Primary three, I heard my history teacher talk about Jesus. I said, Lord Jesus, I uh, am always at the tail. Please, can you bring me forward to the head? That year, from position 38, I jumped to number 6. I think it's not bad. I'm still not number 1 yet, but at least number 6. When I studied in England, then the Lord gradually, I, I took number 1. Uh, and that year, I started going to church. Yeah, I came top of my class. So it's from the tail, you must become the head. Don't become the tail. The tail is you are the last guy. Uh, everything only you only enjoy the leftovers. Some people tell me, "Oh, I'm not interested in being the head. Uh, I don't want to be the head. I want to be the tail." That's silly. Why do you want to get dragged around by other people? But I like the way God put it in the second time in verse thirteen. He, uh, you know, NIV puts it very strongly. He used the word, "You will always be at the top." You see the word top, N-I-V? You always, I like the word. If you are the top, I like always to be the top. And never at the bottom. Have you got it? Nah, that's what N-I-V says. Of course, most of us who are Chinese are very modest. You say, no, I, I, I bottom can already. Bottom can already, I no need to be at the top. Why do you want to be at the bottom when uh, you can be at the top? I don't mean top to show off, but top in terms of decision making. Top in, in, is similar to being the head. You don't want your kid to be the bottom, isn't it? Do you want the children to be the bottom and not the top? So, God has to make you. God has to do the making. So seven active words that God participates in blessing you. So it's not something that is arbitrary. It's not something that comes uh, whatever will be, will be. It doesn't come by fluke. It comes by action. So God works quite hard, you know. But unfortunately, many of us don't even know how hard he works. All we hear is God want to whack me with curses, curses, curses. You heard it wrong. God never whacks you with curses. Curses are things that we choose. You choose. So God said, I said before you this, blessing and curse, choose. Choose blessings. It's amazing that God has to tell us to choose. So let me sum up all this. So these are the language. Okay, you got it? That's B. You understand the B, the language? And then C, you got it in your notes? I un understand uh, the word uh, ex extensive or extends. It means God is thinking in terms of Extending the blessings, not restricting your blessings. So I've got for you uh, four words. 
that uh, you need to remember and check off in your um, in your in your notes because these are the language of um, sorry now oh, let me see here God extensive so you see the language used here all of you have read this passage before but did you notice these three word this this word every every everywhere can you spot where which verse says everywhere it's in verse 3 everywhere you go city or country I, I like the way the the writer puts it city or country I have my own acronym I say far and wide whether you're far or near okay everywhere second every direction whether you're coming in or going out whichever direction there will be a blessing. He says, everything you do. And then he used the word always and never. There are other la languages here that God used. So I've shown you three sets of last language that God used to try and convince us that he wants us to receive his blessings. Can you at least identify this three groups of language, God's love language. And stop thinking that God is waiting to curse us. Because some of you may be thinking, why keep on talking about curse? Because curse are the warnings to be avoided so that we can take hold of the blessings. So from this three set of languages, does it look like God is trying to restrict us? So, can you see why I use the word magnanimous? More than we deserve. Okay, lastly, I got any limited time. I want to talk about common misunderstandings. There are four key misunderstandings that accounts for why Christians, so called people who call themselves Christians, don't experience these blessings. So some theologians therefore say, oh, Deuteronomy is for the Jews, not for us. Does it say it's only for the Jews? But Romans 15, 4 says, whatever is written in the scriptures, that means the Old Testament, is written for our learning, that we, through the encouragement of the scriptures, might have hope. Hope for what? Hope for blessings, hope for the future, hope for eternity, hope for peace with God. That's why we need to know Deuteronomy. Because God wants us to experience the abundance. What a misunderstanding. The first misunderstanding is that um, the question, is it real or not? Because most of us don't experience it. Most. When you sing that song, God is good, God is good, but you don't feel anything because you haven't seen what's so good. But that's because we only see him what? That we don't believe that God is a magnanimous blesser. We see him as a stingy God with a stick waiting to whack us. Second, uh, so the prophet Isaiah says, you people who don't believe, can you look at Abraham, how God has promised him. Because of Abraham's covenant relationship, God has blessed Abraham in what way? Do you remember? We covered this. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, or, uh, um, back in Genesis 12, 4,000 years ago, what did God say to Abraham? How did God bless Abraham? God called Abraham. He said, can you remember seven blessings? At least if you remember six is good. What are they? Great name. I'll bless you, God says. You'll have a great name. You'll have a great nation. You'll have a, you'll be a, you'll receive great blessings, three greats. 
Fourthly, you'll be, you will receive great blessings and you yourself will be a great blessing to many. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. You are going to be a great blessing to others. Then fifthly, God says, those who bless you, I'll bless him. Sixthly, those who curse you, I will curse him. I know there's a lot of conflicts in the Middle East now and people are, are talking against Abraham's descendants. I didn't say they are good or anything, but please don't curse them. Because God says, I'll, because of the covenant, I'll curse you if you curse Abraham's descendants. And of course, God promised him an inheritance that everything you step on on this land I'll give it to you, an inheritance. Sevenfold blessing. I've also covered with you another blessing set which we talked about uh, um, two months ago from Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus 23-25. Can you remember the blessing? God says, because you um, are keeping in covenant with me, I give you sevenfold blessings. Can you remember what they are? At least one. Exodus 23, God promised that I will bless you. I'll bless your food and your water. I'll bless you against the diseases I inflicted unto the Egyptians. I'll bless your health and uh, I will bless your food. Uh, but thirdly, I'll bless you with protection against your enemies. I'll bless you with full life span so that you do not die a premature death. I'll bless you with inheritance. Some more, two more. Go and read it yourself. Then we already covered what are, how do you recognize that these blessings are not operating? The opposite. A, for accident pruneness, always falling down, breaking your bones. B, barrenness. You work very hard, but your harvest is very little. Third, chronic diseases, always sick. Fourthly, D, premature death. D for death. E, emotional breakdown. F, financial difficulties. Or family breakup, divorce. So, you should remember what are the signs. Please don't say, Pastor, why you keep talking about curse and blessing? Because your entire life is going to be a, either a blessing or a curse. Why are you living under a curse when you can live under blessing? And today's sermon is the pinnacle of God's pers trying to persuade us to say that I'm here for blessings. That's why we don't understand it. We don't experience abundance because you cannot experience this abundance without faith. So this talk and these messages are supposed to stimulate your faith based on God's word. And then, if the Lord is faithful, you need to trust the Lord, trust in his faithfulness. And then, why does the Lord spell out more curses and blessings? This is an answer I want you to write in your notes. The Lord wants us to experience His magnanimous, magnanimous blessings. He knows that carnal attitude and sin will void or block the flow of blessings. That's why He gives us 53 curses. Some people ask why we keep talking about it. Last week we talked about these 53 curses. Because God is saying, listen carefully. By paying heed to the warnings, 
we can then take hold of the blessings. So instead of you experimenting and then making a mistake, God says this is how people make the mistakes. Can you avoid it, learn from them, rather than you going through the same thing? That's why 53 curses. Some people say, why are we doing it? Can you remember what are these curses? It's important to remember because if you remember them, you avoid it. And lastly, does the Lord bless or curse arbitrary? Remember, it's our choice that determines our destiny. And if you can help your children to make the choice for blessings, you determine, you help them determine their destiny. Their destiny will be great. And I've told you how great from the beginning. Let me sum up this. Can you recognize this? Drawing? All right. Your leaders have all this, okay? So I made this so that those of you who have to teach your children can cover it, all right? Uh, it's, it's about what are the blessings? Okay, can you remember them? You can't get the blessings if you don't remember them, okay? Firstly, we talk about everywhere you go. Verse 3. Can you identify this in your Bible? Country or city. Number 2. Um, can you, let's go this way. Womb and health. That talks about productivity. Verse 7. Victory in battle. We talk about food and fruit. That means your food basket will always be full. You are not struggling with finding food to put on the table for your children. Food and fruit. We talk about home or away, in and out, verse 6. This is what God has promised. God says, you'll be made head and not the tail. Don't aim for the tail. Don't be arbitrary. Oh, some people say, I don't mind uh, a head, tail, or middle, or nowhere. It's, it's not like that. You have to claim it. But God strengthens it by saying, always top, never bottom. Always top, never bottom. And I like the word top. Top stands for being the top. P and the word top stands for abundant prosperity. Okay, this one is uh, abundant prosperity. It's in verse 11. Abundant prosperity. Not just prosperity. Your, your net leaders have all these pictures. Ask him to send to you. Honored by nations, you'll be set high above all the nations of the earth. And then another time, God says, I will set you so that you will uh, you'll be known by all the nations of the world and they will be fear you or respect you because of they see blessings upon your life. He says, I'll establish you as my own people. Because if God disowns us, you will not see heaven. You will not see blessings. You will be blotted out. So you have to be established. He says you'll bless all the works of your hands. Now that covers everything. And he says you will open heaven. And he will open his bountiful storehouse. He will send rain into your life so that you will not live like someone living in a parched land where there is no water, uninhabited. God says, these are, count how many blessings. Do you know how many we have gone through one by one? Do you know how many? 
if you count properly, you probably find 13. But if you group them together, you may find 12. So let's say 12. How many of these will you take hold of? Or is it that it's only for special people? No, the special people talk, God talks about are people who are covenant keepers, people who understand spiritual principles about cursing and blessing. Uh, Deuteronomy, we are going to come to an end to this. After that, sorry, don't come and ask me what is blessing, what is curse, how to take all of the blessing. Uh, and don't come and ask me, so how now do I take all of my blessings? What are my blessings? Hey, pay attention. I give you notes. I've uh, we put in many hours on this note. I, I rewrite it again and again and again. And thanks to my wife, who is got is an English major, and. Uh, so we had to keep on refining it. And then finally, I've taken the trouble to give you a mind map. When you get to heaven, you cannot complain to God that I didn't tell you any of these things. All right. I have one neighbor. One day he told me, Philip, when I get to heaven, first thing I'm going to complain to God about you. I say, sorry, huh? what, what did I do? Huh? You preach to me the gospel. I say, what's wrong with it? Oh, when we, early, early, you didn't do it. You do until I, my, I divorce, then you come and teach me. He said, I'm going to complain to God that you didn't teach me enough. And you, didn't, you were not serious enough. Uh, and you didn't take care of me. Every Sunday, my wife invites him over for dinner. Uh, he's forgotten how many meals he has eaten. He said, I'm going to complain to Jesus. <laughs> I don't know how many of my members will complain to Jesus. Some of them can't even wait to go to heaven. Some complain that after I preach, why, sir, pastor, why you go over time? Uh, why you keep on saying this and that? Well, you choose. I'm trying to help you to get into blessings. Over the many years, I started under curse, but I begin to study God's word. I found that, yes, we should live under blessings. And if you feel that being here, you have enjoyed part of the blessings, can you give thanks to God? So when you go into your small groups, I've given some guidelines for you, right, please, and for you to evaluate. I've given you this picture so that you can talk to your children. I also give you the last part that you do an evaluation. I leave it to you. Small group can discuss. Let's pray. I'd like you to make a choice before the Lord. If you see, if you, after you hearing God's blessing, God makes so many attempts. Maybe at least you can thank God for His, His effort. And then maybe you want to say, tell God that you want the blessings because uh, God doesn't give it to you, force it upon you unless you truly want it. Can you make a transaction with God? What's your choice? Can you tell God, Lord, I've misunderstood you, but I do want your blessings. You talk to God yourself. Don't worry how bad your situation is. God's blessings are magnanimous. Take hold of it. If you have done your transaction with the Lord, I want you to stand and I want to pray a blessing on you. Just shall we stand in closing? Father, we recognize we have made a mistake in the past. Lord, we are sorry we misjudge you. We think that you are a God who is out to whack us with so many curses. We misunderstood because we don't realize that these curses 
comes upon us as a natural selection and choice that we have made. But today, Lord, we know how how magnanimous you are. Help us, Lord, because some of us still think it's too good to be true. And yet, Lord, many of us, we struggle in our lives. Our children struggle. We have never really taken care to hold of all the blessings you have talked about. Father, I speak faith for your people today that Lord will believe that no matter how bad our situation is, you have got abundant blessing for us. You said you open the heavens, you got a bountiful storehouse and you want to release it to us with an open heaven. But Lord, forgive us for unbelief because we think it's too good to be true. But it's because you are too good, Lord. We only see the bad side. We talk about curses. We think that you are God out to curse us. But Lord, you really want to warn us so that we do not miss the good things you have prepared for those who love you. Open our eyes, Lord. Each of us, we try to teach our children uh, your goodness. Lord, we've learned some of your language of your generosity. Help us, Lord, to know how to make use of it, that we might help our children also to be the head and not the tail. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.